All right, so because we don't have a podcast this week, we're filling in with some content for our CrossFit athletes explicitly. Though, if you're a bodybuilder, powerlifter, weightlifter, and you're looking to involve more concurrent training, these major concepts may work for you as well. Well, they'll work for you, but it will perhaps be uh, an education or insight into how you can involve a more concurrent plan rather than just your traditional main lifts, high level specificity, no real sense of off season type programming. If we have, and this would be for a CrossFitter at this point in time relative to the open season. So uh, it would also be for a CrossFitter who has a lot of requisite skill. So you're not going to see a lot of built in skill work, though I will provide examples for where skill could fit in uh, and how it fits into the larger week. And although it's just a glimpse into one week, I will also touch on how I would advance this athlete. What you need to know is where you want to finish and you work in reverse. So a snippet of one week is helpful, but you want to know ultimately where is this going to end up so that you know the intention of your training uh, stimulus. So the way we start our CrossFitters week off is with a good dose of intensity, and that would be intensity specific to their cardiovascular training. That intensity would stay up Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday, it's still there, but not as much. And then it's going to undulate for the rest of the week so that come Monday again, uh, they're going to be fresh and ready to go. Now this has the name of one of our athletes here. This is not her program. This is just a sample. Um, Grace, I assure you if you're watching, this is not your program. Okay, it's more educational. So we're always going to write in for a specific warm-up that helps the athlete prep their major joints. So on day one, we're looking at this as a lower emphasis day and we have uh, indicated not often for our athletes because they may might not know the terminology though most of them are coaches and they do but this is for the coaches who are likely watching this for the programmers who are likely watching this just to help categorize things a little bit more neatly so we have a lower body emphasis we're working on ATP CP work and it might uh, also be a day where you can train anaerobic, anaerobic glycolysis. All of that having to do with greater intensities marked physiologically by how long you perform them. That ATP CP system is super quick, kind of hit it, quit it, you're done. You can't put together as much to total work per session and as much duration per set because A, you just won't be able to maintain that intensity, and B, if it goes past a certain time period, and we've spoken about this in our cardiovascular series, then you're no longer training ATP, CP, you're training more anaerobic glycolysis. And for a CrossFitter, they don't really need uh, you know, a huge ATP, CP type store for CrossFit Metcon, but it doesn't hurt to have these uh, higher intensity pieces to undulate the cardio efforts throughout the week and also tap into that feeling of like that suck, right? Because that's associated with those energy systems more so than something slow and long and oxidative. I have here that we will always feature before an Olympic lift some kind of technique and that technique work will be specific to our individual athlete. We write individualized plans, we don't template uh, programs, while we do uh, feature consistent elements of fatigue management, and perhaps people will be doing snatches and squats on Mondays and upper body work on Tuesdays. It's all designed to fit what works for their time. So we might have, have this kind of work for someone who has half the amount of time that say uh, a 90 minute or an hour long session would require. We might even involve different rep schemes and supersets so as to help that athlete fit this in their time schedule. In that sense, it is truly individualized. And I'll explain the individualization aspect of it further uh, as we go into the first exercise beyond the weightlifting, which is the squat. So they've done their Olympic lifting. 
if this is a brand new client, we're keeping weights light to see how they move. Uh, we might even involve forms of intervals so that they can uh, basically put it on uh, autopilot. They just go, they lift, they're not trying to show anything specific for the camera or overthink how they lift. They're just lifting, whether it's every 90 seconds, every two minutes, uh, every minute on the minute, it gives us pretty honest feedback as for how they lift without them trying to manipulate anything based on things that they've maybe recently looked into or recently have been trying to uh, fix. We wanna see it as it occurs naturally. So with the squat here, a lot of people will see three in the tank and that looks new. Well, we periodize our effort and we periodize our effort per exercise based on that intended effect for where we want to end up. So for this back squat, we have here three in the tank. If I started someone off with a 12 rep max, they would just get destroyed. I couldn't really go anywhere from there. If I'm having them establish a 12 rep max and it's truly a 12 rep max, so there's one left in the tank, or that would be an RPE nine or 10, then we'd really deload. Or maybe I would have to max out like a 10 or an eight, but those frequent max efforts, uh, they don't allow the athlete to practice good technique and it doesn't allow the athlete uh, to gain momentum throughout their mesocycle. So instead, we start with few sets and we might have typed in here, and this is very common for us to do, video last set. And we might ask from a specific angle, we might give them a specific cue, which you'll see in different aspects here, but it's two sets, it's three in the tank, it's momentum building. The next week might increase five or 10 pounds based on how that first week looks, and we might just bump them up one set or we might even just keep the sets the same because we want to allow momentum to build. Because volume, if this is what we're training, not strength, but volume, and a lot of CrossFitters are limited in their ability to demonstrate their cardiovascular abilities and their work capacity. Well, if you get ultimately to four uh, or five sets of eight to 12 reps in that final week of training before a deload, and you only have two minutes of rest per, between sets, that gets really tough. Uh, we can also invert the reps and sets. So if uh, their work capacity really wasn't there and they wanted to really emphasize technique, we could write, uh, say, uh, 10 sets by three reps and make the rest shorter. So it's less likely that the technique will come off as the reps per set, or sorry, as the repetitions increase within the set, and with shorter rests, there's more of a cardiovascular component to that. So there are different, definitely different options. If this person had incredible relative strength, which a lot of high-level CrossFit athletes do, and say that this athlete uh, is super confident that they're going to get through the open, which doesn't exist anymore, but in this hypothetical, that they were then going to go up against a regional field where their strength was the limiter, we could write for something strength-based. We wouldn't want to write instead for something volume-based. However, for uh, the kind of uh, uh, type of training that we want to set up and the momentum building that we want to create, this propagation of gains, so to speak, we might actually start that person who needs to work on strength and if we've never worked with them before, we might start them off with volume to see how they move, to see if we can clean up any technique and then take them into more intensity. Next, we get into some kind of posterior chain type movement. Totally depends. Um, depends on uh, a few things. Uh, it depends on whether or not perhaps they enjoy uh, particular exercises or have noticed that certain accessory exercises work for them. The thing with accessory ex exercises is that once you try something novel, it is very likely going to get you good gains, but afterwards the novelty of it and the gains that you reap from its novelty will go away. So we just wanna make sure we're creating a balanced program so that if we squatted and it's a lower emphasis day, we don't want to only hit the quads, though you could certainly set it up to be like a quad day on one lower emphasis 
and a gluten ham on another day, but that's kind of might how we structure might be how we structure a bodybuilder. But for the CrossFitter, we want to hit all of it, and in that same day, we might just pick some kind of posterior chain exercise because it's a CrossFitter who, when they hinge in their sport, there's a lack of eccentric control. We might highlight for them uh, control the eccentric phase of the lift or aka lowering phase. Okay. And then lastly, they would finish it off with some kind of bike, ski, row, sprint, some kind of interval. Again, this is uh, just like a flash in the pan type effect. Uh, flash in the pan is the wrong idiom, but you, I think you know what I mean. It's a really intense bout, but it doesn't last too long. It's most impactful on the body, so it's gonna take the longest time to recover. That's why we get it in on Monday, not on uh, uh, Saturday or Sunday when they're going to have to be ready for their squats again, especially if uh, we want to make sure that their legs are fresh, most specifically for that squat come the backside of the week for the 13th here. When you look into this next day, and by now you've realized that this is going to be a pretty thorough video, breaking down things one step at a time. We have uh, a day that is primarily uh, upper body emphasize, and we're training still in this anaerobic system. So we have, in this instance, a bench press. Same idea of a periodized uh, effort or RPE. So we have three in the tank per set. The following week, we might have two to three in the tank. And the way you can gauge that is that the rep cadence at these reps in reserve, you can go RPE on a scale of one to 10 or reps in reserve. Two to three in the tank, would be about an RPE of seven to eight. You can think of it uh, as taking the difference between reps and reserve and RPE. But at that point, especially like that three in the tank, because that can be hard for people to quantify or conceptualize, it's easy to gauge one in the tank. And this is from technical failure, not from shit's gone out the window type failure, poor technique type failure. That's never acceptable. Um, maybe safe for like extreme instances of competition, but still never really acceptable. Um, we just want to make sure that they know the intended effect so that they can begin to understand their bodies and they can understand the specific muscles of use, the techniques involved, because we're going to be really making sure that their foundational techniques are solid. If I wanted to train this athlete for strength, let's say it's a female athlete who has amazing uh, uh, upper body strength. They can do handstand push-ups, toes to bar, kipping pull-ups, but maybe they don't have the foundational expression of strength relative, uh, or say on an absolute level, meaning their 1RMs relative to their multi-rep abilities. Well, like I said, still we might want to start them off with this type of volume so that they gain momentum and we can work on technique. But if we wanted to train strength because their relative strength is out the window or through the roof, <laughs> My analogies or idioms are, are kind of all over the place right now, but um, if we wanted to work more on absolute strength, we certainly could. Here you have maybe a 70%, take three sets of five. RPE would be seven uh, or eight, two to three in the tank. That's a good place to start a strength cycle. Uh, if we did some kind of undulated periodization, the next week could be 75%, say four sets by three to four. Uh, you can also reference Prelipin's chart here for more details on strength training. But I just want to give you a sense of progression here. The next week, if you come back up here, would be three sets by 8 to 12. And you'd see that that would be two to three in the tank. I might bring the weight up five to 10 pounds based on how the first week's video looked and based on the athlete's honesty and ability to uh, rehearse a set of 12 within the reps and reserve. Now, because fatigue will accumulate as you go, especially for volume and not as much for strength, you might have, and this is why we have a rep range, the reps per set decrease if you're being honest to the intended effect of reps and reserve or RPE. It's synonymous at this point, or they're synonymous with one another. So that, let's say I get to 12 rep cadence starts to slow. Okay, that was my good weight. I keep the weight the same. And next set I get to 10 rep cadence starts to slow. 
okay, now my technique's feeling good. Say this was week two, I have three sets. And this is totally arbitrary. We might start with three sets. We might start with one set. Um, just for these, this purpose, it's two sets. But on week two, if I get to that third set, my technique's feeling much improved. Okay, now I'm putting together another set of 10. So it's 12, 10, and then rep three. Okay, I'm, I'm accumulating more fatigue with my technique. I'm totally getting my shoulders pinned back and down. And now I put together another set of 10, but the relative effort was the same, three in the tank. We want the reps in reserve to get harder so that ultimately, this again is not a novice athlete. This is an intermediate to advanced CrossFit athlete. By that last week before we deload them, it's one to two in the tank, one in the tank. So each rep is near failure. They're accumulating a lot of fatigue. Technique has to be perfect um, per set. We wouldn't ever do that with a beginner. We might keep them in this three, two to three uh, RPE zone for safety and for uh, technical proficiency. Uh, let's say I have a pull-up next, okay? So that's kind of like a primary pulling action. I'd say the pull-up is a primary vertical pull. The horizontal bent row might be like a primary horizontal row. I can involve a little bit more bodybuilding. It never hurts to just keep uh, the exercises varied, involve some bodybuilding just to keep the athlete having fun, adding maybe some size in this off season uh, and developing their work capacity. We can even say no rest between exercises and 60 seconds rest between rounds here. Um, but I'm taking some kind of push pull complex. I mentioned before that skill wasn't really a, a concern for this athlete. Their skill was sound, but I could maybe even just make this dealt secondary. That could be a handstand push up. And then lats, that could be a toes to bar. I could make that an EMOM and that's a push pull superset. So you get creative there. But I haven't done that here because I can take an EMOM and work on anaerobic glycolysis uh, and maybe like not to exceed because of the physiology of this energy system, 30 seconds. It might involve three movements, four movements, five movements, it doesn't matter. Um, you just involve exercises that perhaps upon interviewing or looking at the questionnaire of the athletes filled out, if they're a CrossFitter, different types of CrossFit specific skills that they need work on under fatigue. That would work really well there. We go to Wednesday. We've accumulated a good amount of fatigue, but not too much because it's week one, it's momentum building, but we've accumulated a good amount of fatigue just because our cardio intensity has been higher. So we're gonna back off on the cardiovascular intensities on uh, this hump day. But before we get to the cardio, we're gonna again just say prepping major joints. We have demo videos attached. And today we're doing clean and jerk. So we're gonna warm up with specific clean and jerk technique. We're not going to guess at first what that's going to look like. So we have certain foundational kind of screens that we use to see what people's technique looks like in the clean snatch or the snatch clean and jerk. It's not going to be perfect over time, but, or sorry, it's not going to be perfect in the beginning as for what technique drills they need the most, but that improves over time. We start with maybe basics like position work, um, uh, power jerks in the jerk, etc. cetera. Um, okay, this day is not a squat emphasis. It might be a deadlift emphasis. I have here, not rest 22 minutes. This is, happens when you get very specific in your programming, when it's very individualized, you send athletes programs that have 22 minutes rest, despite how many times you might uh, read and reread for typos. So uh, I might have conventional deadlift. The intention should be stand as fast as able. So I might type this out and be like, ooh, I should remind them of that here in the squat. Stand as fast as able with a controlled eccentric. I might even say while we're training volume, uh, no bounce. Okay, uh, because they're not getting that eccentric during the open and when you get to open prep, it's a lot of touch and go cleans and deadlifts. There's no eccentric uh, action. We have it built in here. Uh, we have it built for a CrossFitter because the deadlift is what they need for their sport. The deadlifts involved in CrossFit. For a bodybuilder, uh, probably better ways to hit the posterior chain for volume that's not uh, going to be as taxing the body. Maybe like a Romanian deadlift would be a really good one. For a weightlifter, it could be like a clean style deadlift. Probably not for too much volume, um, uh, depending on where they are in their season, but just to highlight, it would be specific to their sport. Our CrossFitters are really the only ones that do higher volume conventional style deadlifts. Then we'd have some kind of secondary quad work for the same reasons why we'd have secondary posterior chain work. I can draw kind of like an X 
here, right? So I have back squat Monday, secondary quad here, primary posterior chain with a secondary posterior chain here. See how they X like that. That X would kind of extend to these upper lower days so that when we look to, oh, I almost skipped the, the cardio. The last piece here, because we're monitoring fatigue and with a CrossFitter, that's of utmost importance. These programs take a while to write because there are so many variables. We might have them erging for 20 minutes at a certain stroke rate. They're working on certain technical abilities. We might give them a desired heart rate. We might give them a desired stroke rate to keep or a certain type of uh, ventilatory perceived effort, such as just above conversational or hard to, uh, maybe not fun to breathe, but repeatable. However, we can best communicate biofeedback uh, or auto-regulation to them, the better. And it also depends on perhaps what technologies they have available or if they even like that, that type of uh, feedback at all, using like a heart rate monitor versus something that's a little bit more uh, subjective, such as ventilatory abilities uh, based on perceived exertion. And I have here, we might fill in with work that they're not going to get with their sports specific training during the open season and then prep for it. Might train the calves, because why not train calves? And train the abs, because why not train abs? There really isn't a muscle group that you shouldn't train. So we're gonna involve that perhaps at the very end there. This could also maybe even be like a spot to put in different types of uh, ankle work, like, um, jumping or lateral rebounding, things that take them out of a sagittal plane that occurs only in CrossFit. We have a rest day, and because we had a rest day, that means that we can push the cardio a little bit harder. So I have here that ultimately I want to get some kind of anaerobic glycolysis. This might be uh, a similar kind of interval to Tuesdays, but the reason we might put it here and we might hit, reason why we might hit it hard or do like ATP CP type stuff uh, that's similar to Monday is because they've had that rest day. The energy system is more intense, always within the context, not just of doing it to make it a cathartic experience that they enjoy, but doing it within the context of what allows them to recover for the next session. If I backtrack just a tad, we might give them a cue uh, based on things that they're not used to. So a lot of our CrossFitters might hear um, a shoulder press that based on the standards of competition, uh, elbows lock out. Well, for the health of the shoulders, we might not just say elbows lock out, it's the off season. We'll have them blur the line in the open, but instead we wanna reach high. So I'll give a, a cue, reach as high as able. I have another example here if it was a strength set, same as described with the bench press. I have below that an inverse row, and that's where you're inverted, not doing a bent row, but you might have your feet on a bench and you're rowing maybe like a bar set up or rings even you can do, it's like a horizontal ring row is how you can think of that. It trains the lat in the back with, or sorry, it trains the lat in different muscles of the back while resting the spinal erectors that are still fatigued from Wednesday's conventional deadlift. Now, if the, uh, deadlift is something that they're super strong in. They uh, have a really good pull, as most CrossFitters do, and not as good a squat. Here's a scenario that is going to exemplify fatigue management and also the importance of understanding what major muscles are involved so that you can play your cards uh, or play your best hand, play your cards most wisely. If this instead was not working for them and say they had access to a hex bar, I might give them a hex bar deadlift here because they've reported and we see in their numbers that their conventional deadlift is super strong. Hex bar deadlift is something that is much more quad uh, based and it doesn't challenge the spinal erectors nearly as much. If I have a hex bar deadlift here, I might wanna change quads as secondary. I might put something else like a hip thrust, get the glutes involved, okay? So we've had this shift based on this hypothetical character and crossfitter based on where their strengths and weaknesses lie. I'm still having a day that is going to be lower emphasized, but if I involve the hex bar deadlift and they're a better puller than they are a squatter, we get more quads there, so that's good. And uh, the hip thrust is good because it helps finalize that last bit of extension in the squat. You get strong glutes from it. Strong glutes have never hurt a squat. Uh, in fact, there's literature to say that it helps. So if we have this shift, I can look over here and say, well, if I didn't train their back, 
with deadlifts, but they may actually not uh, uh, have the, say, the strongest uh, bent row technique, because I had mentioned that the best, probably most primary horizontal movement would be a bent row. I can make this a bent row rather than an inverse row because we didn't challenge the spinal erectors. Okay? So that's to say that if I had a deadlift, and even with that rest day, if I had a deadlift, and then the next training day, because of the doms of the deadlift, I had a bent row, they would be shocked from that. And there's no way we can get to two in the tank on, or two to three in the tank on week two of this training block. Forget what even that overload would look like. They would probably yank their back uh, trying to do bent rows on that very last week because we've just overloaded the deadlift. So this is where understanding uh, your, some might call it functional anatomy, uh, plays a role. You just have to know what your major movers are and how to understand when you've worked them and when you, you want to rest them. And that's why we have these more or less upper lower type uh, splits truncated every other day throughout the week. Now, we've just hit it hard and that energy system is the hardest to recover from, that which is highest in intensity, shortest duration. So we're going to really emphasize something that is slower, more oxidative. We might do something like bike, however long, mixed model CrossFit, ski or row for however long, mixed model CrossFit. Um, that way it's oxidative. We're working a longer energy system that really is the prevailing system in CrossFit. So that's going to be uh, something that is non-fatiguing. No, it's something that's not as fatiguing as the, the higher intensity bouts, and it's going to create a good base of foundational aerobic capacity, which a lot of people can miss out on. And by putting in, rather than just saying, go uh, for a swim or bike, and that's totally fine. Like that's great. That can go there. For the CrossFitter, having these uh, mixed in, like a, an example, maybe like spike, however long at a certain intensity. That's not crazy. Uh, AMRAP. We bike again. You try to match your pace. You work on pacing, and then AMRAP. These AMRAPs can be different. They can be the same. And if they're the same, maybe you try to uh, repeat the effort of the first one. Uh, with a matched pace to D, uh, sorry, with a matched pace to E, and this can be with a matched pace to E. Uh, so that is going to be a great way for them to uh, work that aerobic capacity and not feel beat to crap come the next session, which would be Mondays, snatches, squats, posterior chain work, and some kind of interval work likely or sprint work. Um, I have here that we could also involve lighter weightlifting technique, just so that in this instance, it wasn't um, one, two, three, four, five, six, six days before they practice clean and jerk again. If they struggle with aspects of the jerk, I could throw it in very light over here or very light aspects of snatch here. Um, if say they wanted to add mass, and we can even add in like upper lower slits before their uh, oxidative work so that maybe we fill in with like another squat session, uh, but in a way where it works so that they can still perform their volume at the end of the week. Maybe it's a squat session for volume at the beginning of the week, squat sweat session for strength at the end of the week, or maybe they need an extra upper body day. We can fill that in here so that all these many training variables come together with a strong sense of fatigue management. If you've made it to the end of the video, that's incredible. When you program for CrossFitters, you do have to be very concerted over your fatigue management because there's so many different factors that can manipulate your next day of training, and you're only as strong as what you can recover from for your next session. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, if you're our athlete and you're watching this, you might make some more sense as to why we do this and why if you looked at another athlete's program, you're like, hmm, that looks similar, but now I understand mine's different because I'm working on these specific things. Uh, but thanks so much, guys. We'll have a new podcast for you next week. Hopefully this was helpful in the interim.